I don't know if you remember, but there was this huge kerfuffle in the news a while ago about the GameStop stocks, which had been driven to immense prices by a Reddit sub. This had caused a whole bunch worth of hedge funds to essentially lose their shirts because they had committed to various futures and options and now they were obligated to deliver certain stocks which they couldn't that they now had to buy at an immense price and it cost them a ton of money. It was a big story that was in all of the major financial newspapers, it was in a lot of the mainstream media, it was all over YouTube. And for a while there, we were all talking about stocks and futures and options and the influence of social media and the power that Reddit has and whether hedge funds should be knifed in the dark. If such a story can in our world form such an engaging plot that we're all talking about it for days, maybe it's something that you can use in your fantasy world. So today, let's talk about microeconomics and how you can use it in your fantasy world to build an engaging plot and a world that people can sink their teeth into. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. If you like what I do here, please do consider buying my book, link below, or checking out my Ko-fi page where you can make a once-off donation or become a member. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and let's get cracking with today's video. One of the first books that I want to talk about with regards to making a plot out of microeconomics is Raymond E. Feist's Rise of a Merchant Prince. Rise of a Merchant Prince is quite a departure from Feist's normal adventure stories. This focuses on the rise of Rupert Avery as a merchant prince of Crondor. Here is your spoiler warning for Rise of a Merchant Prince. I am going to spoil most of the plot with this conversation. Okay, so we start out with Rue starting to do small-scale things like be a wine merchant, and then he gets married to a chick whose father is quite wealthy, and he gets some money from there. And so he's doing small-scale things. But then he comes up with this plot involving futures. So first I should explain what a future is. A future is a commitment to provide a commodity to somebody else at a certain price on a certain date. Both parties are committed. So, for example, I would provide a commodity of X to you. That is my commitment to you. Your commitment to me is that you would pay me for that commodity, the price that we've agreed on. A future is a commitment. It is a contractual obligation, and there are penalties if you don't deliver on it. What happened in Rise of Merchant Prince is that Rue comes up with this idea and he forms a company with three other merchants. They purchase futures from other merchants. So they say to other merchants, we will purchase your grain from you at this price at this time. Okay? So they basically commit to purchasing a lot of grain from a lot of merchants. Then in secret, they go afterwards and they purchase the physical grains from the farmers on the farms. So they now own the grain and they own the futures. Now the merchants either have to buy the grain from Rupert's company at a massively inflated cost, obviously, since everyone now wants to buy grain, or they have to come to some kind of arrangement with Rue Avery. And the arrangement that he allows most of the merchants to come to is that they give him half a share in their business. And that is how Rue Avery ends up owning almost half of almost all the businesses in Crondor. It was a magnificent plot. It was beautifully executed. By the way, in our day and age, it is called cornering the market and it is illegal. The stockbroker authorities in your country will come looking for you if you try this, so do not try this at home. Anyway, in fantasy, however, it was a really well-executed plot. So you can look towards making that kind of plot where you use our advanced financial instruments 
in order to execute on a plot that forces people into action based on their accumulation of wealth. If you like learning about futures and how to use them to corner the market, hit the like button and let's move on to using wealth to destabilize an economy. Here, I'm not going to draw on a fantasy example. Instead, I'm going to draw on the real-world example of Mansa Musa and his destabilization of the Cairo economy. Musa was the Mansa of the Mali Empire from 1312 to 1337. Mansa means ruler or emperor uh, in, in the Mali language of the time. Musa made a pilgrimage to Mecca between 1324 and 1325. He was a devout Muslim. It was, of course, expected that he would make a pilgrimage. However, Musa knew how to use his wealth to flex all over his neighbors. His procession reportedly included 60,000 men, all wearing brocade and Persian silk including 12,000 slaves who each carried 1.8 kilograms of gold bars. His heralds were dressed in silk and they bore gold staffs. They had horses. They had camels. It was a procession of note. It must have looked like an invading army, this pilgrimage to Mecca. Musa provided all of the necessities for the procession, including feeding them, clothing them. The entire thing was at his expense. And he would, in each city, purchase a lot of goods. Now, you would think that that would be good for that city's economy. But Musa also gave gold to the poor along the way, a lot of gold. Again, you'd think that this is good, a charitable gifting, right? The problem is that he severely devalued gold, which at the time was the currency, leading to a gold recession in Cairo, as well as a dramatic increase in inflation. Why would he do this? Well, quite simply, Musa wanted to move the gold trade to Timbuktu, to the Mali Empire, and in order to achieve that, he needed Cairo, which was the hub of the gold trade at the time, to no longer be the hub of the gold trade. So he literally went and outspent Cairo in order to cause a gold recession, in order to increase Mali's share of the gold trading. He did it so well that he landed himself and Mali a place on the Catalan Atlas of 1375. Of course, it could all have been just because he was that devout a person and this pilgrimage could all be above board. But somehow, somehow I doubt that. If you like learning about Mansa Musa and how he used gold in order to create a recession in his neighbors, hit the thumbs up button and let's talk about another fantasy example. This time, let's talk about the traitor Baru Kormurant and the use of inflation in revolution. Again, this is a spoiler warning. I can't talk about this without spoiling the story of the traitor Baru. So in the traitor Baru, the titular character literally uses inflation to destabilize the masquerade. Hyperinflation causes the people to move towards unrest. The people stop trusting their government. And if you think that this is not a realistic way to use inflation, you can see the use of inflation in this manner in our world. Not that anybody per se caused it, but one of the things that Hitler rode into office in the 1930s was the fact that the Weimar Republic was suffering from hyperinflation. So what hyperinflation means is that Let's say today I earn 30 gold pieces. When I go to buy bread tomorrow morning, 30 gold pieces is not enough to buy that bread with. It is inflation that is so intense that you can literally see the prices rising day by day. And I cannot make enough money to stay ahead of the price. This kind of hyperinflation is extremely destabilizing for a government 
because it affects the lives of each and every person in the country. And they blame the government. They will blame the people in charge, quite naturally so. It is one of the fastest ways to incite revolution is to fall into the hyperinflation trap. And Baru uses that, causes hyperinflation in the masquerade and supports the revolution, those who stand against the masquerade. Now, Baru also offers loans at low or zero interest to those who support the revolution, basically purchasing their loyalty through loans. So between destabilizing the economy and offering money, albeit in the shape of a loan, Baru makes a lot of people support the revolution. Now, I won't spoil the final twist for you, but I do encourage you to read the book. It was a fascinating read. It is also an awesome use of economics, that kind of destabilization of a country's government, not by attacking its government directly, but by attacking its economy. It is a storyline that I'm playing with in my epic series, The Sangwheel Chronicles, and that is what I hint at with the Guild Wars that forms the backdrop for The Hidden Blade, which you can check out in the link below. And that is my thoughts on using microeconomics in a fantasy world. If you like this video, you should check out my other videos on economics in fantasy worlds. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds. Don't forget to hit the like button.